You know, it's really funny. I, I only met him once, but it was a really amazing, intense, immersive pre-golf experience. So, so in 1992, I got a Thomas J. Watson Foundation Fellowship to study um, a specific project, an independent project, after college. My project was Contemporary Russian Poetry and its Response to Historical Change. And I was interested basically in investigating the contemporary, at that time contemporary, uh, Russian poetry scene and came across uh, a number of amazing and interesting writers and saw his work first in an anthology called Lichnoi Diela, which was a, it came out in 1991, of, you know, formerly underground writers. And I just found his work absolutely hilarious. You know, I always thought of poetry as something that was, um, you know, serious-minded, and uh, I, I really wasn't exposed to the avant-garde tradition as an undergraduate. So as a 23-year-old, I was just absolutely sort of en enchanted by his work and the work of Dev Rubinstein and some of the other kind of, of the avant-garde in, uh, in Russia. So I translated some of those poems, and uh, but I never got a chance to meet him in 92. When I came back in 96, I did have a chance to go to his apartment, and I just found him to be an absolutely electric person. You know, he was, um, I, I, I actually have my notes from my journal from that uh, meeting, and it's very short, but there was just some characteristic, hilarious things about him. You know, he had all this art. He was endlessly productive, so there was this, just this immense amount of energy about him um, all over the place. And I think he would give me, he gave me stuff and, you know, had this funny stuffed alligator that he used as a prop for our photographs, that sort of thing. Um, after the interview, which was an absolutely transformational experience, because basically in an hour he sort of walked me through a kind of postmodern ana conceptualist analysis of, of culture, of history, of Russia, and of art. And so I, in a way he was one of my teachers, even though I knew him for a very short period of time. So after the interview, it says, we watched a little television. He was like a magnet, turning everything through his unusual mind, singing ballet parts from Carmen to almost launching himself on the couch like a monkey on a nature show. Uh, uh, he was just like just this absolutely delightful, playful person. And right before we left, he, he said, I have one more thing for you. And he took out a stamp and he stamped my hand. It said bullshit in English. And I thought that was great. So, um, you know, I came back from that trip and, you know, I translated the interview for myself to make sure I got all the nuances. But he, he, and he just made me want to make art, you know. So I was working a shit job, you know, in an office in Philadelphia. And I started basically kind of stealing things from the office to make art out of them, basically in the mode of Brigoff. And so I was just absolutely just, um, just enchanted by him and also enthused about what art could do. And I'm not the only one, right? There are a lot of people. In fact, um, one of the major um, architects of Pussy Riot was absolutely impacted by him. And um, so I think that's an important thing to remember is that Vaina and Pussy Riot are very, very much indebted to Brigov's spirit and idea of art. Well, it was just absolutely stuffed with art, you know, like, and I don't mean high art. I mean, just like cans with stuff written on them and alligators, as I mentioned, and uh, just uh, and drawings of various kinds. So uh, it, it felt very much like, like, um, like any Soviet apartment, but, uh, but more interesting in the sense that um, it was just rich with, with, with creations. He's just such, he was such a goofball. That's what I loved about him. Totally unacademic, you know, although his mind was, you know, like a rocket ship, you know, so. Well, um, I think, you know, in a sense, one of the questions you had was how it translates to an American audience. And I think that was one of the questions that I, uh, you know, asked him in the interview in a way. You know, I was really interested in his policeman um, sequence of poems. And, you know, uh, on the one hand, you could say, well, the archetype of a certain kind of police officer that was part of Soviet culture doesn't really exist here. Um, still, still, perhaps there are some kind of parallels. Um, 
So I think that, that yes, Prigov, like many artists, is a deeply enculturated artist. He's very, very much um, responding to the conditions in which he found himself. Uh, at the same time, I think there are certain universals, in a sense. I mean, he was part of an international avant-garde and saw himself that way, although he was making a specific intervention into sort of his culture. Um, so I think that there is a problem translating Prigov, um, as there is translating any art, uh, but that problem, you know, I think is, is, is not a bad one to have. It's, it's about particularity, and it's about... Um, uh, social conduct. So I think that, you know, in a sense, I guess what I want to say is, although his work was very occasional in a sense, um, I don't think it was entirely ephemeral, even though he wanted to produce 24,000 or whatever thousand he wanted to produce, um, that, that there's something kind of wise about those poems, even though he sees, you know, um, he creates all these masks and manques, you know, it's not like um, it's not like he's satirizing them. He's actually immersing himself in all of these kind of personae. And um, so as a translator, I would say that I just tried to capture a little bit of the doggerel element, I think, you know, making sure that there are sort of obvious rhymes and some kind of, you know, pattern um, that was that registered as poetic, even if it was falsely poetic, because I think that that's something that he would appreciate. But also, you know, I hoped that some of the kind of the weird way in which um, a certain kind of wisdom also kind of leaks in, even though there's an absurd element to them. Um, so, so those are the two things I think that I try to show. I mean, it's one of the things that really interests me as a writer and as a poet is the sort of the primordial, almost anthropological um, meaning of, of being a, a poet. And what I mean by that is um, trying to find out what the deep sources in culture and in human, human being uh, are related to, to this, this poetry thing. Um, so, and I think that actually he is an exemplar of some sort of both kind of postmodern, conceptualist, avant-garde, and primal, you know, in an anthropological sense. I don't know if shamanistic is the right term for him, but that's, that's what I want to suggest is that what, what I find so interesting about the best of Russian avant-garde is that it is not an intellectual practice. Fundamentally, it's not an intellectual practice. It's almost a spirit practice. And that's, that's what I'm interested in as a writer. That's what I hope that I, you know, are moving toward. Um, because so much of, of art gets enveloped in sort of academic discourse. And it's not what makes it most alive.